السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Good evening to everybody in attendance. The One Message Foundation would like to extend a warm welcome to everybody in attendance, both Muslim and non-Muslims, to, to, to tonight's event. Just before we introduce the speaker, we have just a few announcements to everyone in attendance tonight. So that is to the visitors, uh, uh, various students from different classes, as well as uh, to everyone else. So this tonight's lecture will not just be the lecture, but also question and answer. So we'd like to ask that all of the students who've come, who've come for extra credit, please uh, stay to the end. As many of you uh, may know, among the Muslim community, uh, One Message Foundation, which we were formerly known as the Islamic Propagation Association, now has become a nonprofit organization. And so we want to mention that all of the events that we do, including to tonight's, uh, tonight's event, is not something that is, of course, uh, for free on our part. It's something that, of course, costs money. For example, renting the hall and things like that has, of course, come at a cost. And so, especially for the Muslim community, it's just something we like to mention to all of you to try and really help us uh, in supporting the da'wah that is taking place in San Diego. So now we're going to continue on. So but before inviting the speaker, we're going to invite our brother from amongst the community here, Brother Adul Qarnayn, who's going to recite for us a portion of the Qur'an, some of the words of the divine revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and after which we will have a translation. A'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال إني عبد الله آتاني الكتاب وجعلني نبيا وجعلني مباركا أينما كنت وأوصاني بالصلاة والزكاة بالصلاة والزكاة ما دمت حيا وبرا بوالدين ولم يجعلني جبارا شقيا والسلام علي يوم ولدت ويوم أموت ويوم أبعث حيا ذلك عيسى بن مريم قول الحق الذي فيه يمترون ما كان لله أن يتخذ من ولد سبحانه إذا قضى أمرا فإنما يقول له كن فيكون وإن الله ربي وربكم فاعبدوه هذا صراط مستقيم فاختلف الأحزاب من بينهم فويل للذين كفروا فويل للذين كفروا من مشهد يوم عظيم أسمع بهم وأبصر يوم يأتوننا لكن الظالمون اليوم في ضلال مبين وأن وأنذر وأنذرهم يوم الحشرة إذ قضي الأمر وهم في غفلة وهم لا يؤمنون إنا نحن نرث الأرض ومن عليها ومن عليها وإلينا يرجعون وقال تعالى إن الله سبحانه وتعالى has said Jesus said indeed I am the servant of Allah I am the servant of God he has given me the scripture and made me a prophet. And he has made me blessed wherever I am and has enjoyed upon me prayer and zakat as long as I remain alive and made me dutiful to my mother and he has not made me a wretched tyrant. And peace is on me the day I was born and the day I will die and the day I am raised alive. That is Jesus, the son of Mary, the word of truth about which they are in dispute. It is not befitted for Allah to take a son. It is not befitted for God to take a son, exalted as he. When he decrees an affair, he only says to it, be and it is. Jesus said, and indeed Allah is my Lord and your Lord, so worship him, that is the straight path. Then the factions differed concerning Jesus from amongst them. So who to those who disbelieved from the scene of a tremendous day. 
How clearly they will hear and see the day they come to us, but the wrongdoers today are in clear error. And warn them, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of the day of regret, when the matter will be uh, concluded, and yet they are in a state of heedlessness, and they do not believe. Indeed, it is we who will inherit the earth, and whoever is on it, and to us they will be returned. And so tonight's speaker will be covering a very interesting discourse with us tonight regarding the topic of, of Jesus or Isa, alayhi salam, peace and blessings be upon him. And so we would like to turn our attention now to Brother Yusha Evans as he discusses with us the topic, Jesus and Muhammad, brothers in faith. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuhu to my brothers and sisters and I'd like to say welcome to all of our guests. I begin by saying bismillah. As a Muslim we begin everything we do in the name of the one true creator of all that exists. And about that creator we say alhamdulillah. All praise, all thanks, all gratitude belongs to him alone. And about the creator we say ashadu in la ilaha illallah. And I bear witness and testify that there is no deity, no God that exists except the one true creator of all things. Wahdahu la sharika la. And he is one, uniquely alone, without any partners. Wa ashadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasulu. And I also bear witness that Muhammad is his servant and his messenger in the long line of messengers. How is everyone tonight? So far, so good. If you're getting extra credit, man, I should make this really boring, I think. <laughs> now I'm going to try my best to keep your attention and to uh, ask questions when I can as well. <clears throat> now, I want to do some role taking. How many Muslims do we have in the room? Raise your hand. Pretty good majority. Hands down. How many people who are not Muslim at this time? Raise your hand. It's about 50-50. Okay. For my not yet Muslim guests in the room, how do you feel being intermingled and surrounded by all of these terrorists? I mean Muslims. <laughs> Excuse the Freudian slip for a moment. No, in reality, I hope that when you have come for our guests, I hope that you have been treated well so far. I hope someone greeted you. If not, please uh, accept their apologies on my behalf. And if you've not been offered food or drink, please accept apologies on their behalf. Because as Muslims, we are taught by our religion to be very, very, very gracious to our guests. So gracious, in fact, that guests have rights. Guests have rights over us and we are to treat them as we would treat our own family members if they were in our presence. So if you've not felt that type of hospitality, then know that it is due to our lack our lack of, of effort on our behalf and it is not anything to do with the religion of Islam. And the, the honor that is given to the guest is not cultural. It is not cultural, it is not a Middle, Middle Eastern culture, it is not an Asian culture. It is part and parcel to the religion itself. So I hope that you receive that the rest of the evening. And I'm reminding all of our Muslims to make sure that our guests feel welcomed. Secondly, as um, our dear brother said in the beginning, if you have questions, please hold them to the end and I will give some format for the Q&A at the end. Um, any interruptions, any er interruptions are considered extremely um, ill-mannered and if the interruption is of an aggressive nature, then we would just ask you to leave the room. Um, my topic tonight is about Jesus, peace be upon him. And the way I want to cover this topic is a way that will be beneficial so that we can try to learn something. I'm not just here to disseminate a bunch of information and then just leave it at that. I want you actually to have something to take home. Um, and I'm going to try to restrict myself as much as I can in the beginning to the Islamic perspective of Jesus. What do Muslims believe about Jesus? What does the religion of Islam teach about Jesus? What does the Quran teach about Jesus? What did Muhammad, peace be upon him, teach about Jesus? And then I will put in some of the places. I can't go through all of them. It would, it would be too much to enumerate. But I'm going to go through some of the points where Islam and Christianity agree about the personage of Jesus and then where they disagree about the personage of Jesus. 
um, what you will actually come to find out is that what we agree upon between in Christianity and Islam about Jesus and again I want to make a disclaimer when I speak about Christianity I'm speaking about mainstream Christianity that believe in the Trinity they believe in the Trinity because there are many denominations of Christianity many which do not hold the views on which I will say we disagree upon the similarly with Islam when I speak about Islam I'm speaking about mainstream Islam that is based on the teachings of the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him that is a disclaimer now I will say that the things that we agree upon are actually more than the things that we disagree upon but those disagreements are major and I do ad admit that and acknowledge that they are major because they go to the cores of tenets of faith they go to the cores of tenets of faith but we will discuss those when the time is befitting and <coughs> necessary now Jesus peace be upon him is a prophet and a messenger according to the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and the religion of Islam as a whole but one thing about Islam is that we are the only other world religion I only make this claim because I've done my research diligently trying to find another religion that holds this belief but we are the only other world religion that holds belief in Jesus as a tenant of faith as a tenant of faith meaning if you do not believe in Jesus, you cannot be a Muslim. You can't. It's more than just believing about Allah and Muhammad, peace be upon him, which we'll talk about later. You also must believe in Jesus. You must believe in Jesus, peace be upon him. If someone were to say, <clears throat> I am a Muslim, but I don't believe in Jesus, peace be upon him, then they would have negated their first statement with their second. They would have negated their first statement with their second. So it is a part of our core belief system as Muslims that you must believe in Jesus and you must believe in the things that I'm going to teach about Jesus tonight, peace be upon him, because these are evidentiary facts found within the sources of, of, of evidence in Islam, in the Quran and in the authentic teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, Islam believes in many prophets and messengers. There is, as a matter of fact, over 120,000 that are mentioned not by name but in number that every single nation had a prophet or a messenger meaning that the Native Americans which I trace my lineage back to I'm from South Carolina I'm from uh, a Cherokee tribe my grandfather was from a Cherokee tribe in Maggie Valley North Carolina I'm as an American as, as it gets more American as apple pie than they say but we believe that they had a messenger a prophet sent to them the Chinese or the Asians, as they would have been known at that time, had a messenger. The people from the subcontinent of India had a messenger. This is something we believe as Muslims. But there are a few of the messengers and prophets that held a little bit of a higher status. A little bit of a higher status. Because these messengers not only were prophets inspired by God to lead mankind to worship Him, but they were given revelation. They were given a newly revealed text that was the direct words of the creator of all things. And they brought with them a law that was based upon that revelation, which taught humanity how to interact with their creator. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm, a, I'm an allergy sufferer and this is the worst time of year for me, so I'm going to fade in and out with my voice. But taught humanity how to interact with their creator based upon law, as well as act with each other or to behave in society. Such of those would be Moses, who brought the Torah and the law. Such would be Abraham, whom we believe also had a revealed text and a law. Such as Jesus, peace be upon all of them, who brought a new text and had a law. And Muhammad, peace be upon him, who brought a new text and had a law. So these prophets are a little bit more special. And you will notice that if you read the Quran, they are spoken of repetitively, repetitively. Because these are major prophets, major prophets. Now, when Muslims mention prophets, we also, as you have heard tonight, add on the phrase, peace be upon them. Or in Arabic, alayhi salam, or alayhi salam for singular. This is a actual prayer that we make. Every time we mention one of these prophets, we pray for the Creator to send peace and blessings upon them. To send peace and blessings upon them. So when we say Jesus, we say peace be upon him. May the peace of the Creator <clears throat> peace be upon him as a sign of dignity and respect for his position as a dignity to respect for his position. <clears throat> now also, as Muslims, the Quran teaches us 
that Jesus, peace be upon him, was a prophet who was sent and entered into this world through a miraculous nature. This is another tenet of faith that a Muslim must believe about Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe in the immaculate conception or the virgin birth. We believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, was born of the Virgin Mary and that his mother was one of the greatest women who had ever walked the face of this earth. So we give absolute honor and respect to her, peace be upon her as well, because she was one of the greatest women who ever walked the face of this earth and she was chosen to give birth to the prophet and messenger Jesus, peace be upon him, without the vehicle of a father. And this was one of the miracles of Jesus to his people. To his people. The Quran describes this as follows. It says in chapter 3 of the Quran, verses 42 through 47, Behold, an angel, and this angel happened to be the archangel Gabriel, or Jibreel in Arabic, came to Mary and said, Behold, your Creator has chosen you and purified you and has made you above all of the women of the world. Has chosen you above all of the women of the world. Mary, your Creator gives you good news that will come from Him, which is going to be a son whose name will be Jesus, the Messiah. And in Islam, in the Quran and in the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we do accept and reference Jesus as being the Messiah. So a Muslim should have no problem with saying Jesus Christ. There's nothing wrong with that statement because the word Christ coming from the Greek Christos, which means the anointed one or the wiped over one. And in the Arabic language and in the Quran, he is known as Al-Masih, which means the anointed or the wiped over one. And he is the Messiah. So we have no problem with that. We accept him as the Messiah to the children of Israel. His name shall be Messiah, the son of or Jesus, the son of Mary. He will be honored <clears throat> in this world and he will be honored in the next world. And he will be one of those who will be brought near to God. He shall speak to people from the cradle, which we believe, and I'll talk about a little bit later, to be the first miracle of Jesus, peace be upon him. The Quran relates that his first miracle was that he spoke from infancy to defend the honor of his mother. And in maturity, he should be one of the righteous. Now, Mary had a question for this angel who's brought this news that she's going to have a son who will be a Messiah for his people. Her question was very simple. How is it that I'm going to have a son when no man has ever touched me? I've never touched another man, nor has a man ever touched me. How am I going to have a son? And the response of the angel Gabriel was, even so, even so that no man has touched you. God creates, the creator creates what he wills. The creator of all things, the heavens, the earth, the sun, the moon, and the stars, creates whatever he wills. He only needs to say be, and things exist. He only needs to say be and things exist. So we believe that the power, <coughs> excuse me, the power that brought Jesus, peace be upon him, into being through the womb of a woman who had never been with a man was through the same power by with which the Creator has created everything that exists. The Creator who has created the sun, the moon, and the stars. It was just as easy, very simple matter for him to create one human being in the womb of a mother without the vehicle of a father. Because the Creator just creates from non-existence to existence. He makes things be. Through the power of His speech. Through the power of His word be. Things exist. Also, we believe that miraculous birth was one of the great signs to His people. To the children of Israel. Because the children of Israel at that time had strayed quite a bit away from the true teachings and the messages that were sent to them through the prophets and messengers. So being that Jesus was the Messiah, the one they were waiting on for so long, then he came with blazing miracles, of the first of them being his conception. His conception. But we stop at that. Muslims, stop at that. We do not go to the point of deification. We don't go to the point of deification. We believe that divinity belongs only to the divine, meaning the creator of all things is the only one to whom divinity belongs to. In Islam, we make a clear distinction between the creator of all things and that which he has created. And those two things are unique and distinct and different from one another. We believe that you have the creator, who in Arabic is known as Al-Khaliq, the one who is created, and he is alone and unique in that. And then separate from him, apart from him, everything else that exists is known as Makhluq, or that which has been created. And those two things are not alike. So we stop at that point of divinity. 
we say that Jesus, peace be upon him, was born of the virgin. He was immaculately born through the power of the creator to create, but it did not give him divinity. Did not give him divinity. The Quran talks about the creation of Jesus, peace be upon him. In chapter 3 of the Quran, verse 59, it says, The likeness of Jesus, or the similitude of Jesus with his creator, is like the similitude of Adam with his creator. Like the similitude of Adam. That Jesus and his creator are of the similar nature of Adam and his creator. The creator of all things created Adam with his own two hands, then said to him, be, and he existed. So therefore the creation of Jesus is as of a similar nature. That it actually was more of a miraculous feat for Adam, peace be upon him, to exist without a mother or a father through the vehicle of being created from the soil of the earth. And then Eve, his wife, who was created from his own rib bone, this was more of a miraculous nature of creation than for the creator to create one human being through the vehicle of a womb without a father. Without a father. He only said to him, be, and he was. Now, we also affirm the miracles of Jesus. As Muslims, we believe in the miracles of Jesus. The first of them being his conception, the first one that he himself performed, we will talk about in a moment. We believe that he gave sight to the blind. We believe that he gave life to the dead. We believe that he healed people who were sick, people of leprosy. And there is another miracle that is mentioned in the Quran that is not mentioned in the canon, which the canon being Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is even a more miraculous than a lot of the miracles you will see. It is the miracle that is recorded in chapter 3, verse 49, where Jesus, peace be upon him, took clay and formed it into the shape of a bird. He took clay, he formed it in the shape of a bird, and then he breathed into it and, it, and it became alive. And it flew away. It became alive and flew away. But the Quran relates how this miracle happened along with all the other miracles. It says, and this is Jesus' words himself, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord. I create, as it were, a clay figure of a bird. I breathe into it, and then it becomes alive by the permission of the Creator. It becomes alive by the permission of the Creator. And I heal the blind, the lepers, and I raise the dead to life by the will and the permission of the Creator. So all of the miracles that Jesus performed, along with all of the miracles that Moses performed and the other prophets, we believe those miracles to be not by the power of the person performing them, but by the power of the Creator of all things who gave them the ability to do these things. Now, we also relate that type of ability to our own lives. For instance, there is a statement that is, was made by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Muslims say it very frequently, sometimes for the wrong reasons. We say, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. That there is no power, there's no power or movement that is possible except but by the permission of the Creator of all things. Meaning, <clears throat> I drove here today from Southern Nevada, but that driving here, even though I got in the car, I put my foot to the pedal, I stared at the blinding road for four and a half hours, and I made it here. But I don't believe as a Muslim, none of that was due to my own ability. None of it. Because it was only due to the ability the Creator has given me to be able to make it here. If my Creator had not wanted me to make it here, I wouldn't be here. Something could have stopped me. My car may not have worked. My legs might not have worked. I might have ended up in the hospital like I did a couple weeks ago eating some almonds that I didn't know about. Anything could have happened that could have stopped me from being here. So the reason I'm here tonight as a Muslim, I believe, is because the Creator has given me that ability to be here. The power to pick up this bottle of water, even though physics can explain it, physics can explain the motion and the, the, the parameters behind it, we as Muslims believe that this power to pick up this is by the power of the Creator who has given me, it to me. Because there are many human beings who can't do this. There are many people who can't do this. So if we have that power, it's given to us by our Creator. If we don't have it, it's because the Creator has not given it to us. Very simple in Islam. So we believe that the miracles Jesus performed, He performed them through the power of God. Through the power of the Creator of all things. Also, we believe that Jesus, peace be upon Him, came with new revelation and new law. New revelation and revised law. 
That revelation in Arabic or in the Quran is known as the Injil. Now, it loosely has been translated to be synonymous with gospel, but it's not the real connotation. The word Injil has really no proper way to define it in the English language, but it is the revelation or the message that was revealed to him from his creator to his people. <coughs> now, along with that revelation, there was also a law on how to live by that revelation. A law how to live by that revelation. And that law that Jesus had, peace be upon him, was something that he himself followed. And it was a fulfillment in the line of the Mosaic law. It was to say the culmination and the fulfillment and completion of the law which began with Moses, peace be upon him. And Jesus even attested to this fact, even through what we have of, of statements and sayings attributed to him by whomever wrote the canon. There are such things as when he was asked, what is the greatest law? He said, I cannot tell you the greatest law without telling you the first law, which is, Hero Israel, the Lord your God is one. By the way, the Hebrew word that is used in the Torah for one is Ashad, which is very similar to the Arabic word Ahad, which means one alone, singularly, unique, different from everything else. But he said, that, Hero Israel, the Lord your God is one. And to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, with all your strength, then to love your neighbor like you love yourself, then the law and the prophets hang upon these two. And when a man came to him and asked him, how do I inherit eternal life? He then responded by saying, obey the law. Follow the commandments, follow the law that God sent to you. Because part of that law is the worship, the worship of your creator. Part of that law is the retribution for social crimes. Part of that law is the law of repentance, of how to correct your, your relationship with your creator. He said, obey that commandment. The man said, I've done that. He said, well, then sell everything you own, pick up your burden, and probably translate his cross, and follow me, and follow me. So Jesus was a proponent of the law. He himself followed the law. The disciples after him also followed the law. They began to go to the synagogues, just like they had always done, and they followed the law that was taught to them by Jesus, peace be upon him. So we believe that Jesus had this law. He had this revelation, and this is what he taught to his people. But we don't believe it exists anymore. As Muslims, and not just as a Muslim, this is something I came to the conclusion to before accepting Islam in 1998. And I wish I was in my early 20s. I was 18 when I accepted Islam. This is making me a little younger than I actually am. Gray hairs give that away. But um, that original message given by Jesus kind of fell away to the, to the, uh, the, the tides of time, to the tides of time. And what actually was the correct message of Jesus or what actually was the um, exact message of Jesus is unknown. It's unknown even to biblical scholarship as far as we can go back, as far as we can go back is to the, the early writings of, of whoever wrote the book of Mark. Um, and that is at least one generation after Jesus, peace be upon him, had already left the earth. So what, and a lot can change in a generation, believe me. A lot can change in a generation. If you were to go ask the people of Vietnam about the Vietnam War, and you were to ask during the Vietnam War, what was going on and then you were to ask a generation later I guarantee you would find different stories going on a lot changes in a generation it's just the nature of information it's just the nature of information we don't believe that message any, any longer exists we don't believe the message that Moses gave exists any longer and I know I'm going to get the question of why I've been asked this a number of times why if God revealed these things why is it that these messages were not preserved why is it that you Muslims hold that the Quran was preserved but yet these other messages were also from the same God you, you claim were not preserved. And that's a simple, simple answer. It's because they weren't meant to be preserved. They were for a time and a place and a people. The law sent to Moses was for him and for the children of Israel at that time. Whenever a new prophet came with a new message, it was because the revelation needed to be revisited and the law needed to be revised. Humanity has grown in the time since Moses, peace be upon him. We have developed, we have uh, evolved. So laws are going to necessarily need to be changed and modified and corrected and adjusted for time and place and personage. So we believe that the message has done that until its completion with the Quran, which would be the final message and law to the Day of Judgment, being that we believe as Muslims, along as with with uh, evangelical Christians and, and Pentecostal and Baptist and Methodist that we're in the last days, that we are entering into the phase of the last days. Therefore, the final prophet and the final message was sent to humanity. Jesus is reported to have said in the Quran, chapter 3, verse 50, I came to attest or to confirm or to witness
law that was before me, meaning the law of Moses, and to make lawful to you part of that which was forbidden to you. See, part of Jesus' message was to the children of Israel that your law has been made very restrictive on you based on their disobedience time and time and time again. Their punishment was that their lifestyles became very restricted. And Jesus came to say, if you believe in me, if you accept me as the Messiah, then I have come to relieve you of a bit of that burden of the law. To relieve you a bit of that. Make lawful to you some of that which was forbidden to you from before. And I have come to you with a sign from your Lord. So fear God and obey me. Fear God and obey me. Also, we attest to the righteousness of Jesus. And this is something where I'm going to make a small side note. Small side note. And this is something that bothers me. Something that bothers me. Now, whenever the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is insulted in mass media, what do Muslims do? I'm asking an honest question. I'm asking now. What do we do? We lose it. We lose it. We lose it. We go nuts. We go bananas. And we make a lot of fuss and a lot of anger is, is spewed out. Um, some, some of it misplaced. Some of it well placed. But that is part and parcel to the religion as long as it's not taken to an extreme. Because we are taught to love the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, more than we love our own parents. More than I love my own self, I'm taught to love the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So let me tell you right now, if you came outside and insulted my mother, um, I'd show you what would happen. Wouldn't end very well. It's just probably out of my anger. But who could blame me? Who could blame me? So if we're taught to love a man more than we love our mothers, then we would respond sometimes angrily, just part of human nature. But what bothers me is that Jesus can be insulted in mass media. Seth MacFarlane does it every day on Family Guy and American Dad and whatever nonsense shows, other shows that he has going on. He insults Jesus regularly. And Muslims don't say anything. We act like we, we have nothing to do with it. When in reality, that's a crying shame. Because we are supposed to defend the honor of Jesus just like we would defend the honor of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. If someone insults Moses, Muslims should be up in arms. If someone inf insults Noah, we should be up in arms about it. Because we are taught in the Quran, in chapter 2, to make no distinction between them when it comes to our belief in them. We believe in all of them, without distinction. So I want to apologize on behalf of the Muslim community that we haven't done more to stand up for the honor of the other prophets and messengers as they are just as well as insulted in the mass media. Um, and we fall prey too much to the antagonistic of the antagonizers. The antagonists, the antagonizers. When they come out with these cartoons, they know what they're doing. It's a prod and it's a poke to get you to dance and do whatever it is you plan to do. Um, but we have to learn to deal with things in a more educated manner. In a more educated manner. And I just wanted to make that real quick side note. Because to be honest with you, these videos that went out, the Danish cartoons, I never saw them except in passing. I never actively looked for them. This video, The Innocence of the Muslims, I never saw it. What other video that came out before it, I never saw it. Never tried to look at it, never wanted to look at it. Why? Because, and if there was a video about Jesus like that, I wouldn't watch it. If there was a video about Moses like that, I wouldn't watch it. Because I know very well and clear that whomever they are depicting on that video is not the prophet whom I believe in. So they have made up a fictional character, given him all of these qualities that are, that are uh, abhorrent in the very least, and made up some fictional man named Muhammad who was this guy. It's not the prophet Muhammad that I know. So how can I defend that? You want me to defend the character you've created that I don't know? Because my prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, wasn't like that. The prophet Jesus that I know is not like that. The Prophet Moses that I know is not like that. The Noah that I know is not like that. So that's my easiest defense, is you are talking about someone whom I don't know. So I don't need to defend them upon that. Um, side note over. Now, so we hold and attest to Jesus' righteousness. That he was righteous. That he was the best of people that ever walked the face of the earth. At his time, he was the best man to have his two feet on this soil. He was the best, the best of the best. And this is why God chose him specifically to be his prophet, his Messiah. Also, 
we believe about Jesus that he will return. This is a commonality between Christianity and Islam. Another one, another commonality between Christianity and Islam. Along with the Immaculate Conception that we believe in, apart from the divinity of it, um, along with the miracles, except for a few that we add on and a few that we do not believe in from the Gospels, such as the turning water into wine, we believe that he shall return. Now, we meet for this one small moment about his return, but then we break off again as to the purpose of the return. Because for the mainstream Christian purpose of the return is for the rapture. Is for the rapture and the beginning of the end of times. Um, but the Islamic perspective is that Jesus, peace be upon him, will return at the end of time, towards the end of time, and he will deal with the Antichrist himself. That he himself will deal with what is known as Arabic as Ad Dajjal, the Antichrist, the false Messiah. He will come and deal with him himself, as is befitting. Someone that is running around uh, like this, Jesus himself comes and deals with it. And we believe that after that, he will continue to live a life. He will help head the state that will be a uh, compromise of believers whose capital will be in Jerusalem. We know all of the minute details about it. We know exactly where Jesus, peace be upon him, will return from the authentic narrations. He will return where? In Syria, in Damascus, more appropriately. And there is a mass, there, excuse me, there is a mosque in Damascus where we are reported to have said from the Prophet Muhammad that he will return. Anybody know the name of that mosque? Minaratul Bayda, that's the Minaret, but what's the name of the masjid? We'll just leave that for now. I'll give you that for some little bit of homework. But there is a mosque in Damascus, they haven't destroyed it yet. <laughs> they have not destroyed it yet, where Jesus, peace be upon him, is reported to have returned. But we don't believe that he's returning as a prophet or as a messenger. We believe that he's returning to deal with the Antichrist. And to affirm for the last time people, affirm for the, 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 the people at the end of times, the true religion once again. To affirm for them the true religion once again. We believe one of the things that he will do is that he will break the cross, symbolizing that he was not crucified, which we'll speak about in a moment. We'll put a pin in that one for a second. Then he will also, we believe that he will kill uh, swine, pigs, and that symbolizing that he never gave anyone the right to break the law that the law should have been followed and that part of the law, the dietary law, is just the symbolic nature of it. And then we believe he would deal with the Antichrist. But we stop at that. Again, when it comes to giving Jesus any credit beyond the fact that he was a prophet and a messenger, we believe that he was no more than a human being, just like you and I. Meaning that he was born immaculately indeed, of a miracle indeed, but we believe that he lived, he breathed, he ate, he slept, he drank, and one day he will die. One day he will die. And the Quran spells that out very clearly when it says in chapter 5 verse 75, Christ the son of Mary was no more than a messenger. He was no more than a messenger. And many messengers have already passed away before him. His mother was a woman of truth, and they both had to eat of their daily food. And the reason why the Quran says that they had to both eat of their daily food, is it shows the attitude of need. It shows the characteristic of need. Being that they had to eat and drink. The creator of all things, according to the Islamic perspective, is not in need of anything. To continue to exist, the creator needs nothing. He is self-existing, self-sufficient, and is existing and he needs nothing. Anything that is in need... Anything that is in need is created and in need of the one who created it. Therefore, if someone needs to eat, then they are in need of their creator to feed them. If someone needs to drink, they are in need of their creator to give them to drink. If they need to sleep, it is because of the weakness of their creation. And if Jesus, peace be upon him, had to eat and had to drink and had to sleep, then the Quran is using this as an analogy that they were in need and therefore part of the creation with no divinity. Also, Jesus, peace be upon him, his first miracle as related in the Quran is that he spoke in infancy in defense of his mother. The Quran relates it that when Mary brought this child, 
And this is also a story related in the Gospels, but this story is not mentioned about this miracle. Then when she brought this child to her people, they asked her what sort of abomination has she brought. You are a, a woman who is not married, and you've brought a child, and you are from an honorable family. You are from a, a righteous offspring. How could it be that you would disdain and stain yourself and your family like this? The Quran relates that her response to them was to point to the child and say, ask him. Ask him yourself. And their response is, how can we speak to one who is in the cradle? How can we speak to an infant? <laughs> what is he going to say? He's going to cry. That's all he's got. But the Quran relates that he was given the ability to speak at this age. And he said, indeed, and this was recited to you in the beginning. This is what was recited. He said, indeed, I am in servitude to the one who created me. Inni Abdullah. I am in servitude to the one who created me. And he has given me revelation and he's made me a prophet. He has blessed me wherever I go and he has enjoined upon me to pray and to give charity as long as I live. And <clears throat> he has made me kind to my mother and not overbearing on her, not overbearing on her. So peace is on me the day that I was born. Peace is on me the day that I shall die. And peace is on me the day that I shall be resurrected unto life on the day of judgment. This is the statement of truth about Jesus, the son of Mary, about which they vainly dispute. It is not befitting the majesty of the creator that he should take a son. He only needs to say when he determines things, he only needs to say be and they exist. Be and they exist. Also, we believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, was only sent to his people. This is the Quranic belief and the Quranic example of Jesus as well as all the other messengers. That they were sent specifically to their people. We believe that Moses was sent to the children of Israel, free them from the bondage of Egypt, lead them to the promised land, which never really came to fruition to right after his death with Joshua. But we believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, also was sent to his people, the children of Israel, which he himself said, as is quoted in some of the Gospels, that I was not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When he was asked why he didn't preach to the Gentiles, he said, I don't cast my pearls before swine. Not disrespecting the Gentiles, but saying that this is not my purpose. I was sent here to get God's chosen people, whom God had an exclusive covenant with at the time, back to the worship of the one true creator and the one true God. So Jesus, peace be upon him, said, now I have come to you with wisdom, in order to make clear to you some of the points on which you disputed before. So fear God and obey me. He is my Lord and your Lord, so worship him alone. This is the straight path. But then sex from amongst them, meaning the children of Israel and the people who decided to follow Jesus. But sex from amongst them fell into disagreement. So woe to the wrongdoers from the penalty of a grievous day. And as a student myself, I've been a student of textual criticism. Um, of, of, of biblical documents and of the Bible, especially of the New Testament for the past 15 years, this is something that is clear from history, is that after Jesus' peace be upon him, especially within the first four centuries of modern day Christianity, there was a difference. There was a, there was a, a huge difference in the whole spectrum about what people believed about Jesus. You had different churches, you had different denominations that were believing different things about Jesus. This is why the councils of Nicaea had to be uh, 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 arranged so that people could decide, what are we going to believe about Jesus? We're going to decide one thing and we're going to believe in that. This is what the Emperor Constantine wanted. He wanted one belief about Jesus, peace be upon him. And those beliefs ranged from Jesus being of one and similar or one and same, the one and the same nature of God meaning that he was fully God, fully man, of the same substance of the Creator, all the way down to, you had many of the North African churches um, uh, who believed that he was nothing more than a messenger. He was nothing more than a man, but they were in a minority. And the political process of the councils of Nicaea determined that we would believe in what's known as the Nicene and the Athanasian Creed. But we believe that those factions split off, and what we have now is very little of what Jesus might have really said, Except, except what we find in God's final revelation of the Qur'an. And one thing I have asked, and one thing I did for research on myself, is that it is part of history that we see that the message of Jesus fell away. Um, because as a young man growing up, I read the Bible in the English language. 
And I know good and well, Jesus did not speak the English language. That English language was translated over from the Greek and from Latin, from the Codex Venaticus, the Codex Venaticus, Codex Venaticus and etc. And I know Jesus did not speak Latin and he did not speak Greek. He would have understood Queen Greek because the Romans ruled over Jerusalem of the day. But Jesus was from a place known as Galilee where they spoke Aramaic. When they spoke Aramaic, they spoke a language known as Aramaic, which is a Semitic language. Which is a Semitic language. Some people in Syria and, and the outlying regions, very, very small portion of the world still speaks this, this language of Aramaic. Aramaic being a Semitic language, if you translate it into any other language, it's impossible. You can't translate Semitic languages. Because Semitic languages hold such deep, intense meanings. For instance, if you translate one word from a Semitic language, such as Hebrew, such as Aramaic, such as Syriac, such as Arabic, that one word may mean 20 different things, depending on the connotation, the context, the grammar, etc. It could mean many different things. And if the person translating it or trying to translate it, the best that they can do is give a commentary on what is being said. Give a commentary on what is being said. And that commentary is going to be tinted towards their beliefs of what that person may or may not have been saying. So what you might have at best with an English, with an English story about Jesus is a commentary translated over from Aramaic or what the stories were going around in Aramaic over into the Koine Greek. Then that Koine Greek was again translated or commentated on over into the uh, um, Latin. And then that was again then translated or commentated on over into the English. So you've lost a great deal of meaning in that. Great deal of meaning in that. So it's really hard especially with no original copies to say what might be the original statements of Jesus, peace be upon him. Except for, for Muslims, we believe that the Qur'an being a revelation directly from the Creator, whatever is in it that is reported to have been from Jesus, we believe that to be the truth. Also, when it comes to the mention of Jesus in the Qur'an, the mention of Jesus in the Qur'an, and this is something, I've, I've heard the accusation that... Um, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, of being narcissistic, uh, of being uh, someone who wanted a religion that was all about him, that he wanted to be the front and center of the religion. And this is hard to grasp when you read the Quran. Because the Quran <clears throat> mentions the other messengers many, 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 many times over more than it mentions anything about the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Jesus is actually mentioned in the Quran by name more than the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is mentioned by name. 25 times by name Jesus is mentioned, 15 times by, by reference, totaling 40. Um, so it's mentioned many more times than the name of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is in the Quran. So we believe that the Quran being the final revelation gives us information about Jesus peace be upon him. And I want to also explain that when Muslims take their beliefs about Jesus, we only accept as fact that which we find written in the pages of the Quran and what is authentically narrated or attributed back to by evidentiary fact to the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, especially when it comes to things about like prophets and messengers and Jesus and things of that nature. Now, the Bible as itself is a book that no Muslim believes in. No Muslim. If any Muslims ever told you they believe in the Bible, then they've just made a mistake out of error of lack of knowledge. Because the Bible is actually a book that was collected by men over a period of thousands of years. The Greek word biblios is what the word Bible comes from, which just means a bunch of books, a collection of books. And we believe these books to be authored by human beings writing stories sometimes from what they heard and sometimes maybe what they embellished upon, upon things that were being said about prophets and messengers or the history of them at that time. We don't believe any single part of it to be divine revelation. Any single part of it to be divine revelation. Now, if there is something in the Bible that agrees with what the Quran says, and the only reason I'm telling you this is because I'm up here to speak the truth. I can't say what I like or what I feel or what you might like. I have to say what Islam believes and what or what Muslims believe and what Islam teaches. If there's something that agrees with what the Bible says, we will say that it's likely, probably that it's true. No problem. It agrees with what we have. If it disagrees, we will say that it definitely did not happen or was not said. 
And if it neither agrees nor disagrees, then we neither agree nor disagree. We remain neutral uh, as well. We take the Qur'an and the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him as the basis for that calculation. So it's very hard to go back and forth as I have done many times and I know other people have done. I know some of our guests may have done with Muslims and some of Muslims may have done with some of our guests. Is to go back and forth with the Bible and things. It's very difficult because we as Muslims don't believe it to be revelation. And factually it is a collection of statements and sayings of what was being said a generation after Jesus peace be upon him at best. Also, as Muslims, and this is the big one, this is why I saved this difference for last, because this one difference, aside from deification, but without deification, this one doesn't matter either, is the ma most major difference, and that is crucifixion. As Muslims, we do not believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, was crucified. We don't believe he was crucified at all. Um, we believe that he ascended into heaven at the time when the crucifixion was going to take place, and something else happened that made it seem to the children of Israel who wanted to bring Jesus up for this crime that they crucified him. Now, I'm just going to take a few minutes to get into this, explain this, because this also will help some of our Muslim brothers and sisters as well understand this concept. How did that happen? I will say, I don't know. Because all of the scholars have said, we don't know, because it is not clearly laid out in the Quran. The Gospel of Barnabas, which Muslims have reported to be the most authentic of Gospels, which, by the way, is not. If you want to go textually, if you want to critically analyze it, it has as much evidence behind it as any of the Gospels does. So we cannot say that it 100% sure is factual. The Gospel of Barnabas says there was Judas who went to the cross. It's a probable cause because we don't know what happened to Judas after the, uh, after the crucifixion. Um, in the Gospels, he died three ways. He hung himself, he threw himself off a cliff, and then in another place, he swelled up till he exploded. Um, one of those three. So we don't know really know what happened to Judas after that. How did it happen? We don't know. And there's also a proponent from the Islamic side. There is a, and this idea has been spread far and wide due to a few speakers. And it's a concept that I not only disagree with, but is totally wrong because it approves the very point itself. Um, and this is a concept that Jesus, peace be upon him, was put on the cross, but he didn't die. Any Muslim heard that concept? Raise your hand. Jesus went on the cross. He just didn't die on the cross. You guys haven't heard that? Okay, good. <laughs> but there's this proponent area that's pushed out there by some major uh, uh, speakers on Islam. That, that Jesus was put on the cross when the people came and pierced him with on the side it looked like he was dead so they took him down but he wasn't actually dead when this actually violates the teachings of the Quran because the Quran says about Jesus you didn't kill him you didn't crucify him so neither one of those things happened the death of Jesus did not happen nor did the crucifixion itself happen because it the crucifixion itself even if Jesus was hung on the cross it would have been a curse upon him that's according to the law in Deuteronomy, and that's what Paul teaches at the beginning of Galatians. Uh, that the, the crucifixion was a curse. Jesus was cursed on behalf of the law to remove us from the curse of the law. For it is written in Deuteronomy, everything hangeth on a tree is cursed. So we don't push that, that proponent out. Jesus did not die on the cross. He was not put on the cross. Something else happened. He was ascended into heaven where he remains to this day. When he'll return and complete his life after he takes care of the Antichrist. That's the Islamic concept of crucifixion. Um, which is the major difference beyond deification that Islam and Christianity have. We don't believe in deification of Jesus at all whatsoever, not even in sonship, nor do we believe in the crucifixion. We believe that the method by which human beings become saved, or the method by which human beings obtain righteousness before God, is the same way they did so at the time of Adam, the same way they did so in the time of Moses, the same way they did so in the time of Abraham, the same way they did so in the time of David, the same way they did so in the time of Jesus, is that they repented. They amended their relationship with the Creator. They repaired their relationship with their Creator through the means which He gave them to obtain it. Whether it was through the sacrifice, through the prayers, or whatever have you, it was a methodology by with which they proved that in their heart they were repentant, and with their outward limbs, they were going to show that submissive repentance to their Creator. Same methodology that we as Muslims hold today. To become righteous again, to get rid of sin, we repent. We make a mistake, we fix it. 
We fix it. Simple as that. If we make a mistake with our Creator, we fix that mistake with our Creator because it's the one whom we have made a mistake against. And if we make a mistake against another human being, will we fix that mistake with that human being directly or by the social system which is in place to establish the laws of crime and punishment? This is how we deal with our lives. But there's a statement about the Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, which I will end with because I want to leave some time for Q&A because I know there's going to be a much greater uh, proponent of Q&A than I've been able to cover in, in, in my little bit of time. But it's a statement from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, about Jesus, which really goes to the core of how deeply rooted Jesus is in the faith of Islam. And this is narrated by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the most authentic of collections of Imam al-Bukhari. And it is authentic. Jesus, uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, what is translated to mean, he said, Whoever, whoever believes that there is only one God worthy of worship, whoever believes that there is only one God worthy of worship, and that that God is alone and has no equal, and they also believe in me, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a messenger, and they also believe in Jesus, peace be upon him, as a messenger of God, also, that he was the word of God breathed into Mary. We as Muslims do believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, was the word of God breathed into Mary. And that he was a spirit emanating from him. And this person also believes that heaven exists. This person also believes that hell exists. So based upon these principles, they believe in God alone, that he is one with no partner. They believe in the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a prophet and messenger. They believe in Jesus peace be upon him as a prophet and messenger. They also believe that Jesus was the word breathed into Mary and a spirit emanating from the creator. These people believe that heaven exists. These people believe that hell exists. Then by these virtues, they will be entered into paradise. By these virtues. That these virtues, if someone holds these virtues, they will be entered into paradise by the permission of the creator. So Jesus was included in that conglomerate of belief system that would give you entry into the kingdom of God in the hereafter. So this is how deeply rooted Islam or Jesus is in the religion of Islam. We believe in many things about him that is in congruity with uh, mainstream Christianity, but, but we stop at deification and we stop at crucifixion. We believe the deity belongs to the creator of all things and that salvation lies in our relationship with the one who created us. This is why we say that Jesus, peace be upon him, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were brothers in faith. Jesus, peace be upon him, and Moses were brothers in faith. Muhammad and Moses were brothers in faith. David and, 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 and Abraham were brothers in faith. We believe every single prophet and messenger were brothers in faith because they came with one simple message. And that message was worship God alone. The one who created you, worship him. Worship him alone. And follow and obey the commands and the rules that he has sent to you to live peaceably in this life. And you will also find peace in the next life. Now, I thank you very much for your time and look forward to your questions. Uh, why do you think some sources say that crucifixion happened and some sources say it didn't happen? Because the that, that is an answer to that question that is unanswerable. Um, it is the process of information process by which information gets to us, it always finds a way to get distorted. Why is it that I can go turn on Fox News and see a story reported in one totally different light, and I can flip on CNN 10 minutes later, see the same story in a completely totally different context, two totally different stories about something that is happening in a world of mass media. There's so much confusion. So imagine a world where there was no mass media. Things were just by person from person and written down by the few people who knew how to write. At that time, maybe 10% of the world was literate and knew how to read and write. So what was written was very few. And oral traditions we know, we know what oral traditions happen over a period of time. They can become very muddled and lost. So it's just a process by which information got to us. There is some information about that difference all the way back to the first generation of church fathers like Eronius and Josephus and things of that nature, some early historians of the, of the church, uh, that there were different stories along the line. It's just a process of information. But ultimately, the truth, no one knows the whole truth. Not the whole truth, no. no. We'd have to have been in
Very few people can know the whole truth about an incident unless you're really there. We can get the relational stories, um, but the whole truth is what we need to trust. Any other questions? Yes, young lady, we're in the back there. Um, you said that when you just come back, once he comes back, he's not going to back to the back of the relationship, right? So is he coming back just as a mere human being? Yes, um, he's coming back just as a mere human being. His prophet and messengership was his, to his people, and that time came to an end. So now when he returns, it will be in the, in the context of dealing with the Antichrist, and then he himself will help establish a new order on the world that will be established on justice. And the only religion that will be accepted will be the religion revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which is the same religion revealed to all the prophets in, in our, in our, in our, um, in our belief system. That all the prophets and messengers, the same religion, Jesus will, again, uphold that religion and accept that religion only from humanity. So for Islam, what, um, like what marks like the end of time, so like the end of the world? The, what marks the end of time in Islam is actually quite a few things that mark the end of time in Islam. There are there's something called minor signs of the Day of Judgment, <coughs> like the prevalence of music, people who are dressed but naked, and a bunch of other small things that we believe have already happened. Then there are major signs of the Day of Judgment. Like one of the major signs of the Day of Judgment is the sun rising from the west. That instead of rising from the east, the sun will set and then rise back from its setting place. Which scientists have proved that is actually physically possible for earthquake or something to happen that it actually can spin the rotation of the earth. We believe also the Antichrist is one of the signs of the Day of Judgment. Jesus is one of the major signs of the Day of Judgment. Um, Gog and Magog, which are also spoken about in the Bible, the knowledge of Juj and Majuj in the Quran, these things are the major signs. <laughs> But in reality, nobody really want, none of us really want to be around in that time. Because it's not really going to be a great time for humanity. Not like we're going through the greatest time of humanity right now. Anyway, but it would not, it would be a much worse time than we even see now. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Did Muslims uh, almost mutually exclude one another's texts? Yep. Uh, where is some middle ground for fertile debate and discussion? And my second question is, uh, what, what would it take for you to disbelieve? <clears throat> okay, good questions, two good questions. The first one is about middle ground, since we deny the Bible and Christians deny the Quran. I mean, where do we find mutual ground to start any consideration whatsoever? Um, the Quran actually answers that question, because that question was asked. Uh, and, it, and it goes to the fact that we come to mutual ground of worshiping one God alone. Forget about your text for a minute, forget about my text for a minute. There is one God who created all things. That's something we believe in. Even if different sects of Christianity might divide that one into three unique personages or what have you not, we believe in one true God of all that exists. And right about now in humanity, I think we've got bigger fish to fry uh, than texts at, at the moment. Um, one of those is getting back to a point to where human beings are human again where humanity actually exists within us again. There are common grounds on which Muslims and Christians can see eye to eye and start to work and, 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 and build bridges, and that's on doing mutual good. Doing mutual good. Um, the, the Christians are out um, helping humanity. I give credit, where, I'm a person who will give credit where credit is due. The Quran tells you to stand up for justice and speak the truth. Um, when it comes to helping homelessness, Christians are out front with that. We Muslims are way behind here in the West on that. When it comes to helping with alcoholism and drug addiction and all of these different things, women, battered women's syndromes, and all of this, the Christians are leading the forefront on that. And, and, and I give credit where credit is due. Uh, we as Muslims maybe need to step it up a little bit. And uh, there's some projects that we could probably work on together with that. And there's no problem with a Muslim and a Christian working on projects like that. The Prophet Muhammad peace upon him himself established treaties um, uh, based upon doing good with people who were not even Christian. They worship many plethora of gods. It's called the Treaty of Fulay. And he said if they were to come into that again after I was a prophet, I would come into that treaty with them again because it's for doing mutual good. So we should come to the fact, look, we worship one God alone. We're never going to come to the end of the argument about texts. It's just not going to end. Um, so let's try to work on what we can work on now. Maybe along that way we can have a discussion about our faiths. But when we decide to become disagreeable on what we disagree on, that's where the problem starts. When we're not able to say, look, I disagree with what you say, you disagree with what I say, we just leave it at that for now. Let's go do something else. We need to learn to do that. Now, <clears throat> as far as what would it take for me to disbelieve in Islam, it would take one thing. Disprove someone 
to disprove one single verse of the Quran. One single verse. That one single verse of the Quran is incorrect, whether it be grammatically, scientifically, whatever have you, disprove one single verse of the Quran, and that would not only probably cause me to leave the religion, it would probably cause a whole bunch of people to do so too. But that challenge was placed in the Quran 1400, uh, almost 50, 1400, almost 50 years ago. And it's stood the test of time to this day. So as long as that Quran stands as the valid proof of Islam, uh, and it is as perfect as it is, then I'm going to remain one. Any other questions? We'll take one or two more and that's it. Yes? Um, I know that it's very hard to ask the question, why does God do certain things? Um, it is. But what is uh, your, inter your best interpretation or like explanation as to why God would have people believe for so long that Jesus actually was killed and then have Muhammad come along and say that actually he wasn't? Like what, what was he trying to teach everyone? Okay, I'm going to be very touchy with this ground because it's a part of the teaching of Islam which is, uh, is a great area which you don't delve in too much, which when it comes to the, the will of the Creator. Though, as to the why, I can't answer. That one I would never be able to answer in, in a million, million years. But one thing I will tell you is that Islam teaches that human beings have a free will. To choose. To choose. To choose what to believe and what not to believe. To choose what to do and what not to do. To choose what to put on the morning and what not to put on the morning. To choose to listen to me or to walk out of the room. We have that right within our capacity to choose. So, and God allows human beings to do that. Because to influence that, or to interject into that, messes with free will. Now, Jesus was sent with a clear message. With a clear message. And His people heard His message. It was themselves who differed amongst themselves, and more appropriately, Paul, uh, who came and taught a completely different gospel than, 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 than what Jesus and many companions were teaching that led humanity to have this faction that even now exists within Islam. There is factions within Islam that go way across the spectrum on belief syndrome, uh, or uh, belief uh, um, um, synopsis. And God allows that to happen because this life is a test on who will seek out the truth and who will not seek out the truth. Who will question that which is put in front of them. We as Muslims are even taught to question what is put in front of us. We're taught. The Quran teaches if you don't have understanding, go ask someone who has knowledge. Every time, every, every single day a Muslim prays 17 times. They ask one simple question, guide us to the straight path. Continue to lead us upon the right path. It is part of the human experience that we are supposed to seek what is right, what is true, what is just, what is honest. And that's part of our test of being here. Now, if someone wants to do that, then the Creator will help them. The Quran says, if the wills to walk upright, we guide them to our ways. But if someone says, look, what I have is right, and I'm not going to entertain anything else. I'm not even going to entertain it. Uh, then that person has cornered themselves off into a life that they're going to live. Um, and what is the outcome of that life is of their own doing. Is of their own doing. The Creator did not push them towards that. They chose it for themselves. But God, of course, knew all of that. So that's all part of the test. All part of the test of humanity of who's going to seek out the truth and who's not going to seek out the truth. Why? No clue. That was one you have to say it to the day you meet your creator and you can ask him by yourself. The why is unknown to us. The why. Okay, one more question. One more question. Yes. Um, you said that sin is fixed the same way that it was fixed with Adam, with Noah, with Moses, with Abraham, with Jesus. Yep. Sin is fixed by repenting. And from what I understand, God is merciful, so that makes sense. Yes. But I also understand that God is just, yep. and that doesn't seem fair. Okay. Good question. God is merciful, but it is also just, so it doesn't seem fair. Now, the first question is, what scale do we base justice upon? You see, our version of justice is quite different. It's not true justice. Human beings can never exact true justice. There's always going to be something mixed in with it. There's always going to be some feeling, or some personal agenda, or maybe some political lean, or something that's going to cause us to act and behave in a certain manner. Our feelings are going to get involved. We're just human beings, it's just the way we work. So no true justice can human beings ever do amongst each other. But now God is truly just. He is truly just. Um, meaning that if we commit a sin against the Creator, He has the right to punish. And we cannot say anything about it. That would be just. We could not say anything about it. But with that same token that he has the right to punish, 
he also has the right to choose to forgive and to not punish and to to absolve it as they were as they were to say and that's all part of the system of the justice of the creator that look if i committed a sin let's say today i didn't pray i didn't pray this, this major sin in islam and if i never try to amend that with my creator then i would pay for that on the day of judgment because i've done nothing about it it's almost as if i didn't care i didn't do it um, but now if i were to go home tonight feel very bad about that repentant and go and pray to my creator please forgive me you understand the, the, the creation that I am created with, that I'm going to make mistakes, so forgive me. Um, part of that concept in justice is that God knew when creating Adam, that Adam was going to eat from the tree in the garden. That was well knowledgeable to him. It was already known. Before creating anything, God knew, I'm going to create this guy Adam, I'm going to put him in this paradise, and I'm going to tell him not to eat from this tree, but he's going to eat from it. But yet, he still created him and allowed that system to happen, allowed the, him to go through with that. Because it was part of our human experience to understand that with free will is going to come the, the, the crutch of making mistakes. They were always going to make mistakes. But within that, that shows us our great need of our Creator. That we make mistakes, therefore we are in need of forgiveness. Every single day I'm in need of... When I go to home tonight, I'm in need of forgiveness. I've done something today to do something else. Tomorrow's going to be the same thing. So it keeps us in this constant attitude of servitude. That I'm in servitude to my Creator. I'm always trying to make amends with the one who created me. And I'll never fully do so. I can't. God gave me life. How am I going to ever give him what is due you right to him? It's not possible. You never. There's no way on God's green earth you could ever give to God what is his right. But we try with the best of our abilities. So as a concept of Islam, even if, even if I were to never commit a sin my entire life. Never. I have never committed one sin. I lived a hundred years. I would still be my creator on the day of judgment and it. I would still be in debt to him because he gave me life, he caused me to live, he created me, he gave me eyes, he gave me ears, he allowed me to walk, he allowed me to eat. So every day I was accumulating debt even though I wasn't sinning. And therefore the only people who will ever make you to paradise are whom God forgives, forgives because he understands the condition he created us in. And that's just, that's just, but it's, it's in his hands. So that's how Islam weighs out that justice, that yes God is forgiving, but he is just. He is just in the sense that he will always do justice between human beings. But if we make amends for that, part of that justice is that he will absolve us from that and allow us to uh, be forgiven for it. So, since we don't know what his justice is, how do you sleep? How do you know that he's, it's been met somehow? We'll, as Muslims, we never know that it's been meant. Like, if I ask for forgiveness, I don't know for 100% if I've been forgiven or not. Therefore, I work hard tomorrow and the next day and the next day. I don't give up. But it is also part of Islam that we never become despondent of the forgiveness of the Creator. It is also a sin to say that I can't be forgiven. That's also sinful in Islam, to say I cannot be forgiven. So what we do is we do our best. We do our best and we work as if we will be forgiven. We work as if we're going to work for it. Because there's also a hadith from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which is known as Hadith al-Qudsi, which means it's the words of God, but the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said it, but it's not part of the Quran. That I am as my servant perceives me to be. If my servant perceives me to be merciful, he will find me merciful. If my servant perceives me to be angry and, and revengeful, that's what he'll find. And that's also part of the psychology of, of Islam is that if you see a person who thinks that God is always out to get them, they will live a very pessimistic life. And that's what they'll find in their life. They'll always find that everything's against them. But a person who lives with the attitude that, you know, I have a kind and merciful God, even though he is just, he understands my condition and I'm going to work hard tomorrow, then that person is an optimistic person. So then that's what they will find in their life and that's what they'll find in their judgment. So it's more of an attitude that I don't know, but I'm going to work for it. I'm going to work for it. Thank you. All right. I'm, if anybody has any more questions for me, I will be at the sweets table outside again. Please.